talk tonight is because I um, had an experience with a uh, South American ethnomedicine called ayahuasca uh, more than 20 years ago that has really shaped my way of thinking about just about everything. And I wanted you to tell you the story of how that, of how um, the work that was initiated back then is leading to the idea of getting ayahuasca tea, which is an intensely psychedelic um, natural medicine through the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, so that it will be available to people in the United States. So um, what I'm going to do now is share my screen and I am going to um, start a, a slideshow and um, and I think you can all see that. Um, Erica, can you confirm that we're good? Good to go? Yes, I can see it perfectly. All right, so first of all, let me tell you who I am. So um, I um, got a naturopathic medical degree at Vassar University after I became a neuroscientist because I became fascinated by plant medicine. And then I wanted to study Chinese medicine and I got a master's in acupuncture and oriental medicine. And then because I'm fascinated with cancer and it's uh, how, to, how to treat people who have cancer, how to prevent cancer, what is cancer? Um, I'm a fellow of the American Board of Naturopathic Oncology. And um, I have two roles currently. I'm the co-director at Ames Institute in Seattle. And I'm also a co-CEO of a new company called Sacred Medicines, which is a public benefit corporation. And um, I'm just going to take you through my journey. I'm not going to talk long. I hope it's interesting. Just relax. I have a lot of good pictures. Um, I think you'll really enjoy this. So um, I think many of the people on the call are aware that we have what's being called a psychedelic renaissance. Um, in, in the world and particularly in the United States because in, in the 1970s, there was a clampdown on all psychedelic drug research and that clampdown, that suppression is just now starting to be released. Um, and this drug MDMA, which is uh, uh, known as ecstasy by people, is very soon going to have Food and Drug Administration approval for the treatment of PTSD post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and this is the long name of it, um, for those of you who are interested. There's now a whole bunch of research on dimethyltryptamine, LSD, psilocybin, which is the molecule inside psilocybe mushrooms, uh, some species of psilocybe mushrooms, mescaline, which is present in some cacti. And then I added ketamine too, because ketamine um, is different from all of these in its mechanism of action, but it is the it is a uh, anesthetic that in very low doses produces a very interesting psychedelic state. And when I say psychedelic, what I mean is it really means literally mind expansing, uh, expanding. And we use ketamine in our clinic to induce the psychedelic state for our patients who have PTSD, depression, anxiety. And a lot of our cancer patients have been traumatized by the diagnosis of being diagnosed by cancer, being treated with cancer, the fear of cancer. Um, and so we've been using ketamine, but all of these now in, in rapid development, this is now turning into a multi-billion dollar industry. And it's kind of like a psychedelic gold rush going on now um, all over the world uh, in, in the Western countries. But these are all single molecules. What I'm interested in whole plant medicines. So uh, the ancient psychedelic medicines have been used since, well, we don't know, but probably since the early dawn of humanity. Um, we know that psilocybe uh, mushrooms, here's an example of one that grows in the Northwest, contains the molecule psilocybin that was used in Central America. Um, there's a little bit of evidence that it was used also in the Mediterranean area, area during the, um, the pre-Christian days. San Pedro cactus contains mescaline. 
Um, you'll notice that most of these end in I-N-E, I-N-E, and that's because um, these are alkaloids. And that's not because alkaloids uh, usually end in I-N-E and they all contain uh, these very special plant alkaloids that have a very special effect on the human brain. There's also a frog that uh, grows um, in the Sonoran Desert that has a molecule in, its in the pads of its feet that is called 5-methoxytryptamine. Uh, um, and these are, these are ancient psychedelics. And the reason I put this picture here is there is some evidence, and I think mounting evidence, that psychedelic medicines were used in the Eleusian mysteries that um, is the origin for much of our, for, for our Greek and Roman foundation of Western culture. And this is, um, there are some images, this is Persephone and Demeter. And there are scholars who believe that they are passing forth uh, between each other a uh, psilocybe mushroom. Um, and then, um, Aztec, um, Central America, the Aztec Mayans, uh, the Toltecs all use psychedelic medicines. And here is a, um, a sculpture that is ancient. Um, I don't know how old it is. It's an Aztec sculpture, but you'll see that what's, what's, embed, what's engraved in the sculpture are um, images of psilocybe. This is a psychedelic mushroom. Um, morning glory is believed to have some psychedelic properties, et cetera. Uh, nicotine tobacco is not psychedelic, but nicotine, another alkaloid, has very potent effects on the nervous system. This is a modern rendition. I love this. I have this poster in my house. And what it shows is this guy looking into the skies, into the heavens in a state of ecstasy. And these are the examples of the molecules that produce the psychedelic state. They're all very, very similar. And the, there's a common mechanism of action among them, uh, which is an effect on the serotonin neurochemistry system of the brain. Now, I became really interested in the ancient South American Amazonian ethnomedicine called ayahuasca. Um, because I had an experience of drinking it in my late 40s. I traveled to South America to investigate this medicine, to find out how it affects the brain. And I sat in a ceremony with 50 other scientists and, and, and physicians uh, with a guided ceremonial ayahuasca, uh, traditional ceremony. And I had what I describe now as my first um, awakening. Uh, I, I had an experience of, of seeing reality in a totally new and different way. And that one experience um, really changed me. It's a great, um, it's a great way to experience um, a, a reality that is usually hidden from us. And it's considered many people in the psychedelic, um, in the psychedelic field consider ayahuasca to be the grandmother of all the psychedelic medicines. Um, and just a little bit about it. Um, it's been used not probably for thousands of years, not just centuries, for both spiritual and, 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 psych and physical healing. It's always been used in a ceremonial setting, in a group setting in South America. Most of the tribes, 78% of the tribes, the, the, the uh, indigenous tribes, of the Amazon basin rainforests utilize Amazon as one of their key spiritual medicines and their physical medicines too. Um, Peru considers ayahuasca to be their national treasure. And then in Brazil in 1992, um, ayahuasca was um, exempted from the list of illegal drugs. Previous to that point, it had been. And these, I have some pictures here just to show you of what a ceremony might look like. Um, this is, you'll see, there's things to point out here. You will see people lie down in a circle. You will see these buckets. Those are for vomiting. And vomiting is considered a very important purgative, cleansing, medically important, psychologically important part of the experience. And then in the center, in some traditions, there will, people will come up from the periphery for a special 
healing by whoever is leading the ceremony. Another, another example is, a, it's almost always in a circle. I've never seen an ayahuasca ceremony that is not in a circle. And, one, and lots of music. Typically there's singing, uh, drumming, percussion instruments. And you'll notice once again, the buckets. The buckets are ubiquitous. And then here's another example. And they're beautiful ceremonies. They're typically done at night, all night. Now, ayahuasca tea is just basically a decoction, a boiling of two plants. And this is a picture of what it might look like if you were in South America um, at, an, at a traditional ayahuasca ceremony by a shamanic practitioner. And they, that practitioner might make their own ayahuasca. Other pictures, this is another one. And you'll see that there are at least two plants in here, leaves and vine, leaf and vine and boiled all day long. This is what it looks like. It's typically stored in South America in uh, like plastic Coke bottles. Um, and uh, it's highly stable. And a dose, let me see if I have it. A dose, this is about the size of a typical dose. Another typical dose. And this shaman is pouring out in, into a sacred turtle shell. And often ceremonies, the, the tea is drunk from a sacred uh, cup. And as I mentioned, purgation, vomiting, and diarrhea are very, very common. And some sh shamans say, if you haven't vomited, it's not working. Um, but that's, you know, we, I don't know, but that there's lots of notions about um, the removing uh, toxins, both psychological and, and, and physical toxins through uh, just complete clearing of the gastrointestinal tract. And I think that's part of why a lot of people with uh, bowel problems like irritable bowel syndrome, uh, Crohn's, etc. Um, I have seen with my own eyes as a physician having a real big benefit from this uh, ayahuasca purgative effect. And because we are the Vashon Art Center, I want to talk about the art. Um, there is a particular form of psychedelic art that comes out of South America. And this is an example. I'm sorry, I don't know who the painter is, but you, this is, you, if you saw this, you would say, oh yeah, that's definitely an ayahuasca painting. Uh, undulating, um, DNA looking stuff, snakes, um, spirals, angels, suns, eyeballs. And what this is a picture is of oh, lots of uh, lizards um, and there's probably hummingbirds in here somewhere. Ooh, what's that? I don't know. I mean, you, oh, there's a leopard, a jaguar probably. And these paintings are so elaborate, I just love them. Um, another example of psychedelic art. Now this is Alex Gray, who is an American. Uh, contemporary painter. And uh, many of you may know his Sacred Mirrors um, paintings, but he is well known for his psychedelic art. And if you're interested, um, you should really look at his paintings. They're incredible. And then here's another one. I love this painting. Um, and you see, there's oftentimes you see spaceships in these South American iconographic paintings. Um, and uh, let's see what else, eh, birds, rivers, plants. It's like the biosphere coming alive, ancestors, really into ancestors. Okay, so why, what, why is ayahuasca such a big deal? I think it's because um, it is, um, I think ayahuasca, um, is ready to come into the West because we have a mental illness crisis and we also have an addiction crisis and which comes first? We don't know. I recently saw the documentary called Seattle is Dying. And I, if, you've seen, if you haven't seen it, watch it. It's about the uh, homelessness problem in Seattle and its relationship to mental illness and addiction. But the point is, is that these psychedelic medicines now are being brought into Western medicine for the treatment of PTSD, depression, suicidality, 
anxiety and existential despair at the end of life, complicated grief, and now there's even some, some strong evidence about the anti-addictive properties of ayahuasca. So our purpose, I mean, my purpose since I drank ayahuasca was to bring ayahuasca to my friends, family, patients. And after I drank ayahuasca um, in my late 40s, I, my mother had uh, recently died from suicide. She killed herself. And I just said, oh, if only she had had the experience of ayahuasca, she maybe would have avoided that, that I thought too early suicide. So uh, many of us are saying that modern Western civilization desperately needs the return of sacred medicines. And our vision is that one day Medicare um, is going to cover the cost of ayahuasca group therapy. And um, it's very interesting that Medicare and most medical insurance companies already cover um, the cost of group therapy. And group therapy is very cost effective and has uh, effects that go beyond, there's an, a group effect that um, ayahuasqueros, um, ayahuasca healers know about intimately. Um, and so the traditional ayahuasca experience, you start with an intention. Often there's dietary uh, preparation. Sometimes the, the diet, we can talk about that, but there's special diets. Um, and the diets I think really boil down to um, eating vegetables, eating plainly, no spices, no alcohol. Um, it's always a group therapy. It's led by a shaman with assistance. It's almost always done at night. And either a single or multiple dose of tea is given throughout the, the, the evening. And there's almost always live music. Um, Ikaros are the, is the name of these songs. They're ayahuasca songs, they're spiritual songs. And then integration of the experience afterward is very, very important. <clears throat> so um, ayahuasca, uh, the legality of ayahuasca is ayahuasca contains a molecule called dimethyltryptamine. And that the Drug Enforcement Agency has said ha is a molecule that has no medical value and has addictive potential. And um, as many of you on this, on this call know, there is a uh, decriminalization of nature movement that is saying, how can you make a molecule that a plant produces illegal? That just doesn't make any sense. So it is very, it is legal to grow the plants that make ayahuasca. That is not the same with marijuana. Marijuana has been, um, is still, according to the DEA, a schedule one illegal drug. Um, the DEA has been very slow to change with the times. It is important to know that there are two legal ayahuasca churches that use ayahuasca tea as a sacrament on a regular basis, the Unio de Vegetal Church um, and the Santo Daimi churches. Um, there is widespread ayahuasca drinking in Brazil, Peru, Costa Rica has retreats, um, the European Union, there's retreats in Italy and the Netherlands and Spain and all over the world. And as, as I like to say on any one Friday night in Manhattan, there are probably at least a hundred ayahuasca circles going on. Um, it's spreading um, it's, and it's spreading because it's such a powerful therapy. Um, so the question that I have been asking myself, well, how are we gonna proceed? How can you do impeccable scientific research of the sacred while respecting and honoring the indigenous healers in South America? And that is a question I think it is possible and I'm gonna explain how we think we can do that. And this is a painting by the famous painter Pablo Amaringo, from, who I believe is Peruvian. Um, another example, here's an ayahuasca circle, a small one, and this is the imagery that's produced from that uh, from the minds of the people in that experience. Um, I always think it's important to thank your teachers. And I have had marvelous teachers. Um, Dennis McKenna um, is an ethnopharmacologist. Um, Ali Maya is an anthropologist who knows a lot about ayahuasca anthropology. Um, a healer, Waira, that I met in Peru through Dennis, 
um, taught me a lot. Uh, Francois Demange is a, a ayahuasquero that travels throughout the, uh, the world. And this is Terence McKenna. Um, I did not meet him, but I was highly influenced by his marvelous books. Um, Kat Harrison, who's an ethnobotanist, and uh, Eduardo Luna, uh, who's an anthropologist and an ayahuasquero as well. Ayahuasquero is, is someone who leads traditional ayahuasca ceremonies. So uh, after I drank ayahuasca, I thought, oh my goodness, we have to protect these precious plants. So um, Terence McKenna had recently died in the late 1990s and I became the steward of his ethnobotanical preserve on the big island of Hawaii, where we've been growing the plants now and the plants are very happy in this tropical forest. I wanna talk a little bit about, well, how does ayahuasca work? Ayahuasca works very similarly to the other psychedelic medicines. This is a little cartoon from uh, Terence McKenna. Um, when, when the um, Harvard ethnobotanists went to South America, I think in the like 50s and 60s, they encountered ayahuasca and they named the active constituent telepathine because they didn't know what it was. And the reason they named it that is because many people in these ayahuasca circles say that they have telepathic experiences with people far, far away. Uh, or in the group, and who knows, but, um, and I love this quote from Terence, you cannot imagine a stranger drug or a stranger experience, and it, indeed it is strange and marvelous. And the mechanism of most uh, psychedelic medicines, hallucinogen is not a good word. You don't really hallucinate. That's, I don't know who, that is a bad word. I call them psychedelics, mind expanding, is they work on a kind of serotonin receptor called the 5-hydroxytryptophan 2A receptor site. And here's a picture of a serotonin neuron, 5-HT, 5-hydroxytryptophan, and showing you that, um, that the MDMA, psilocybin, mescaline, and LSD, and DMT work by stimulating the 5-HT2A receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. And that produces incredible changes in cognition, perception, um, imagination, vision, uh, hearing, all the sense senses are altered. Now the, the plant chemistry behind this is most ayahuasca is made from two plants, Psychotria viridis, these are for the leaves, this is what it looks like. And um, these leaves contain dimethyltryptamine. Many, many plants, including our own bodies, we make dimethyltryptamine. So it's, this is a natural product. Um, why these plants make it, we don't know, but what most uh, scientists say is that um, it deters uh, predators um, from eating the leaves. And it's interesting, these leaves grow in Hawaii, they, they have absolutely no predators, or no, nobody eats them. And then the other plant is the vine, Venisteriopsis copii, which contains the beta carboline alkaloids, mostly harming, that make it so that when you drink ayahuasca, the vine makes it so that uh, the DMT is not broken down in the intestines and can get into the brain. And this is perhaps the most complicated um, plant or uh, drug technology on the planet Earth is combining these two plants to improve bioavailability. It's very, very sophisticated. And I, I just honor the ancient scientists that somehow figured this out in the rainforest of the Amazon thousands of years ago. <clears throat> um, I mentioned the purgative and vomiting, essential part of the experience. And then harming itself has a lot of effects. And um, there's evidence that it might be useful in treating Alzheimer's disease and other kinds of neurodegeneration. So you'll see there's going to be a lot of research on using psychedelic medicines for Alzheimer's and other disorders like that. There's evidence that uh, ayahuasca dimethyltryptamine um, is, is, uh, is a way to, um, mm -mm, is, is to enhance neuro regeneration. Um, and so this is just a picture showing that brain derived neurotrophic factor is upregulated in, um, in the psychedelic experience. And that is believed to produce uh, neuronal sprouting. 
and the neurophysiological effects have been well characterized. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but some of you may have heard of the default mode network, which is when the brain is at rest, when we're just lying, if we just lie in our back and just close our eyes and let our minds wander, the brain will go into this rhythm. It's called the default mode. And it's got this very, it's got this rhythm going. And um, so what we found is that psychedelic drugs disrupt this default mode network. And some people, including me, think that that is one of the pivotal reasons why it changes consciousness so radically is because you kind of wake up. You, it's like the default mode network. Some people talk about it, it's like the monkey mind. It's like the self recriminating, the depressed mind, the worried mind, the mind that you know, just watch yourself when you're at rest. Um, what are you thinking about? What's going on in your head? Most of us, it's kind of negative stuff. Um, and then there have been in, not in the United States, there have been absolutely no research on ayahuasca in the United States yet. And, and beca because it's illegal, it's very difficult. Um, we have we're doing it now, but we had to get uh, drug enforcement agency approval. Anyway, it's been shown to have antidepressant effects. This is a study that was done in Peru showing very statistically significant uh, uh, effects on depression. And the thing that's amazing is that a single dose of ayahuasca in some instances, and there's a paper on this from Peru, University in Peru, a single dose can produce an antidepressant effect. And uh, you think about the impact, you know, the difference between that and the antidepressants that are used by what 7% of the American public is taking some kind of antidepressant drug. And they also work on the serotonin system, but none of them work by a single dose. So this is huge. And I often call ayahuasca a vaccine against despair. Sometimes only a single experience is enough. Just way a single vaccine is enough to create immunity. Um, there's evidence of uh, potential treatment for alcoholism and tobacco. This is a beautiful picture. I love this. Um, the Santo Daime Church, a typical, uh, well, this is like very elaborate and big, and this is probably shot in Brazil. Um, but the, they, there's dancing and singing and the people wear white and the dancing goes in a circle and they will drink ayahuasca tea and dance and sing all night in a very uh, beautiful routinized way. Um, it's been shown that ayahuasca users in South America have less alcohol and less tobacco use. Good studies. In addiction, we think uh, we've shown now and I mean in clinical trials, not in the United States, but in South America, um, you see in Unio Vegetal members, um, a lot of ca Canadian researchers are in this, Spanish patients showing a reduction in, in use of addictive drugs. And then anxiety, PTSD, um, there's a, long ago, um, Dr. Dos Santos did a study of the Santo Daime members showing that it reduces anxiety, panic, and hopelessness statistically significant. And then here's the question now. So in order for us to bring ayahuasca into uh, and to uh, Americans, one way is to go through the Food and Drug Administration and develop ayahuasca as a botanical drug. And that is what um, me and Victoria Hale, my co-CEO are doing. And I wanna show you um, plants that grow on this preserve. This is the ayahuasca vine. This is probably a vine that's 30 years old. And uh, just, to, there's, I should have put a person here. A person would go up like this. So these big thick vines that go high up into the trees. And then when you cut them, this is what they look like. They have these cross sections. <clears throat> And this is uh, the preserve that, that I inherited from Terence, I call the Opihi Holly Ethnobotanical Preserve. Here's another example of a vine growing. More, more vine. I think it's just so beautiful. And then I just wanted to thank my, my graduate students, my medical students over the years. 
Um, I've, I, I started this research at Bastry University. I've gotten great help from my students um, over the years. Uh, one of the first things um, I did to figure out, well, okay, if we're gonna bring ayahuasca to America, well, how would you make it? So I gathered tea samples from uh, 15 ceremonies in South America and Hawaii, and I measured what was in them. And I found out how much dimethyltryptamine was in them and how much of the other alkaloids. This is the harmine, this is from the leaf and these are from the vine. And what I found is that they don't vary very much uh, between South American teas and uh, Hawaiian teas. I thought that was remarkable. So that was the basis, the starting basis for formulating. And this is, we've been, we made this in the lab. This is kind of what it looks like. Uh, these are showing uh, high pressure liquid chromatog chromatography uh, uh, data points showing you how we measure um, the alkaloids in this. And then we bottle it in 50 milliliter autoclave bottles. Um, we submitted in 2016, an investigational new drug application, investigation new drug application in order to do a phase one trial for our formulation of ayahuasca tea using the plants that grow on that ethnobotanical preserve that were vouchered in Peru. So we know exactly what the plants are. And I wanted to show you what an IND application looks like. It is an enormous amount of work. So uh, we, we, there's, there's so much research now in ayahuasca, none of it from the United States, um, but dozens of animal studies, dozens of clinical observations, safety observations in greater than a thousand people. And so we're, what we're hoping is we're gonna do the phase one trial in 2021 at Ames Institute where I'm sitting right now. Uh, Ames Institute, we, we opened in 2018 largely um, so that we could do psychedelic medicine research. And these are just some pictures. We're down on East Lake in, in Seattle. Um, we do um, both group psychotherapy, individual psychotherapy, individual psychedelic therapy with ketamine. And then one of the issues that's really important is reciprocity. And one of the questions that comes up is, is well, why do you what? Why do you think you have a right as a white person um, to extract this sacred medicine out of this culture and and possibly misappropriate it? And um, so we've spent a lot of time talking about how are we going to reciprocate with the scientists and the indigenous communities that developed this amazing medicine. And that's a whole conversation in and of itself. But for one thing, we're growing our own plants so that we don't, <clears throat> we don't contribute to the decimation of the Amazon forest. And um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, MAPS, uh, Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies um, is the organization, it was, it was started, I think, in the late 1980s by Rick Doblin. And this organization single-handedly figured out how to get MDMA uh, approved by the FDA. And so M, uh, the MDMA will be the first um, psychedelic uh, drug that is approved in the United States. Um, and we got a wonderful donation from uh, from Robin Weshkin and Bill Belosky, um, who are uh, Seattleites. Um, I wanted to point out if you guys want to, anybody wants to talk to me about anything, this is a good email, Leanna at sacredmedicines.earth. And you might want to check out this um, website if you, uh, if you want more information. And um, I'm going to stop now and I'm going to answer questions. Thank you, Dr. Standish. Um, we got a we got a couple of questions come in through email um, right yeah. before we uh, right before we started. So I thought we might start with those, and then um, anyone that wants to ask a question, um, if you're comfortable with that um, 
using that reactions button mm -hmm. to uh, to raise your hand. Um, that would work great. Um, or if that doesn't work, and go ahead and put it in the chat, and and we'll get to it that way. Um, so let me just start off with this one. Um, how close are we in Washington State to being legally able to administer psychedelic medicines in mental health um, facilities in the state of Washington? Very close. Um, Oregon did it just last year. And as some of you may know, uh, in Oregon, there was an initiative to approve the psychotherapy use of, of psilocybin um, by psychotherapists and that bill passed and it's happening in California and it's happening in Washington. And I think what's going to happen is that gradually like cannabis, um, state by state will be decriminalized. And, and the movement is to decriminalize natural psychedelics. That's why I say decrim nature movement. Let's see, and uh from the same person, there are several training programs available for licensed practitioners interested in becoming psychedelic sitters slash therapists. Can you foresee which trainings might be recognized when certification becomes available? Well, really good question. So, so um, right now there is no formal American ayahuasca healer facilitator training, we're going to create one at Ames Institute. But until then, um, we're going to learn from and work with um, uh, shamanic healers from South America that have been doing this in their lineage for many, many, many years. You know, we, I, I feel such humility, um, you know, uh, in, in front of these people who've been using ayahuasca as a medicine their whole lives. So, uh, but right now there isn't, and, but I, what I would say for those of you who are anticipating getting ready for the psychedelic movement and for uh, those of you who are psychotherapists is MAPS has a training for MDMA. And, um, and so our program at Ames Institute, we're gonna ask people to have gone through either the MAPS training, the California Institute of Integral Studies has a program. Um, there's a really good program. Oh, I forget the name of it. Um, I can come up with it later, but right now there's nothing formal and we really need it because ayahuasca is not for, it's warrior medicine, it's hard, it's an ordeal. It's not something you buy on the internet and take home and do by yourself. It needs to be done in a group and it needs to be done with someone who knows what they're doing. Oops. Um, how would one pursue in-office experience with working with psychedelics in a research setting? Well, um, right now, um, the MAPS MDMA studies are available for people with PTSD. Um, for those of you who are interested, right now, the easiest and available psychedelic therapy is ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. Um, and that is, now, there are many clinics, not many, there's a few clinics all over the United States that are, that are offering this. And we do that at Ames Institute as well. Okay, and then here's a couple more. Um, for someone who has, who has had um, traumatic brain injuries, how safe are these to take? Um, well, ayahuasca, uh, we, there's no data that I know of about um, ayahuasca being a therapy for traumatic brain in in injury. However, I think that in the years to come, we're going to find out that all psychedelic medicines um, have an effect on brain regeneration. So if, if I had TBI, uh, what I would do is um, seek out a ketamine clinic because it's legal, insurance covers it, some of it, and it's safe and we know tons about it. Uh, let's see, for someone who was withdrawing from 36 years on antidepressants, would you consider this a safe thing to take? Well, it's, you don't take it. I mean, it's not like a pill that you take. It's like a ceremonial ordeal. 
So for someone on 36 uh, years on an SSRI, an antidepressant, very, very hard to get off them. But if, the, if you have done that, congratulations. I think what a lot of people are doing now is using uh, microdosing of psilocybin, which is still illegal um, for getting off of antidepressants because um, low dose psilocybin is believed and actually there's pretty darn good data is antidepressant. I suspect in the decades to come that the use of these, um, these, these drugs that you have to take every single day for your whole life um, are going to disappear. I don't think they're going to be with us. I think there's going to be much better methods. Okay, let's see. One more here is, what would be the benefit for someone who is happy now, but older, 78? Well, the benefit is to, <laughs> is to experience other dimensions of reality. I mean, you know, I thought... I, I thought reality um, was one thing. And after drinking ayahuasca, I opened up to much more fine tuned sensitivity to the biosphere, to nature, to everything, to art. And so anybody um, at any time who's happy, I say, go for it because mind expansion is a really wonderful thing. And it's, it's our human heritage. And I will go over to the chat here. Um, a question on, have you studied Vashon's own indigenous mushrooms? No, I have not. And I have not been studying mushrooms. You know, it's funny, about three years ago, four years ago, I gave a talk at uh, the Vashon Art Center on uh, Trimedes versicolor, which is a anti-cancer mushroom. I don't know about Vashon mushrooms, but I bet there's really interesting species there. So. Um, I'd love to communicate with whoever asked the question because I would like to learn more. Uh, here's a good one. Are you taking new patients? Yeah, listen, um, we're Ames Institute. Um, we are definitely open for new patients. So what you would do is just go to the website, Ames Institute, look at it and call up and make an appointment. Come on in. We, and we, you know, you can see if you have medical insurance, one of us ca carries one of them, you know, I think uh, you'll be able to figure it out. Just go to the website. Uh, do you need volunteer participants? Eventually we will. So um, the, the study we're going to do here will, will be 12 to 15 people healthy. Um, and the, the kind of person we're looking for is someone who is experienced with psychedelic medicines um, but not ayahuasca, because it's such an ontological shock. You know, we, we, uh, we, we need, um, we don't want to take people into the study that they've never had any expansion of their consciousness, because it's, it's, too, it's too much. So um, yes, we will be looking for volunteers 32 years of age and older. Why? Because my mother told me that you don't become an adult until you're 32, and I believe that, and that was true for me. Um, and, um, yeah, next question. Let's see. Um, how about micro dosing of ayahuasca? Well, yeah, micro dosing is now the rage and, um, I'm, there is actually a company in Peru in Iquitos, Peru, that is micro generating tiny doses of ayahuasca tea and capsules. And I suspect it's going to be very useful in microdoses, but the research, we haven't done it yet. I mean, it's not ready for prime time. So it would, I would not. Okay, first of all, don't buy ayahuasca if you don't know who made it. I mean, it's, there's so many crappy things going on out there of people making ayahuasca. There was a study published in Estonia um, by a professor in Estonia who collected ayahuasca tea samples um, used in ceremonies in Europe and found out that, what was it? Some enormous percent, I don't remember, but over 50% of them had adulterants in them, uh, like um, a uh, pharmaceutical MAO inhibitors, um, like um, DMT from other plants or DMT powder. So you gotta really be careful. And sometimes they'll add datura. 
Uh, and Daytura can be quite toxic. So, I mean, Daytura is also a sacred medicine, but do not fool around with ayahuasca. It is powerful. And the first time I drank ayahuasca, I'd been a, a physician for a long time. I said, finally, a medicine that actually works, a medicine actually does something, a medicine actually heals. And I, I, uh, and I, I said, you know, a medicine worthy of its name. So don't fool around with it. Uh, are you accepting referrals for TBI patients to your ketamine assisted clinic? Yes. Yes. And we have quite a few patients doing that. Highly recommend it. And we also use ketamine for people who have chronic anxiety. You know, a lot of us, especially now, you know, um, psychotherapists in our clinic are telling us that the mental illness out there in COVID is big. People are really having a hard time. And the psychotherapists that are doing Zoom calls are seeing it. So anxiety, yeah, we use ketamine and I think it's, it's worth investigating if you're interested. What if you've gone through a trauma or loss? Is it helpful or should you wait? Well, I would say any time in, in one's life that you're, you're processing some material, like deep depth, deep material, psychedelic medicine can be very helpful if you do it with a skilled therapist. Um, so I would say, yeah. Um, what about someone who has experienced the transformative effects of ayahuasca, but, you know, months later, the effects have waned? Um, do you see the need for regular boosters? Well, it's interesting to me that the ayahuasca churches typically have ceremonies every two weeks. Um, so, and why is that? Well, it's for community, of course, but it may be that um, there is every two weeks, there's a reason for that. So go to another ceremony and choose wisely. Let's see, I think we, you talked about ketamine for anxiety. Um, yeah. Are there any studies or hard data? On anxiety? Oh yeah. Um, Go go to our website. I think we have some articles that you can read about it. Uh, do you think that some psychedelics are better for certain conditions than others, or are they all equally effective in treating mental health? Um, I don't think I don't think we know, but I envision a future of psychiatry that will be that will have a a panoply of psychedelic medicines and we will know, oh, for this patient at this time, they need cannabis and psilocybin, or maybe they need an ordeal ayahuasca ceremony. And we don't know, it, the research hasn't been done. It's we're in the infancy here. Let's see, uh, here's a comment. Local friends gave me some local mushrooms that they use themselves for therapy. Would it be safe to try them by myself outside a group? I wouldn't advise that. You know, the thing about mushrooms is um, there's, first of all, the idea that you might accidentally eat one of those, you know, poisonous kind. Okay, there is that. But these are your friends. I would certainly not do it alone. Um, and, you know, I, I wouldn't advise it. I, you always want to do these things in a group. Psychedelic medicines evolved in humanity and civilizations as group therapy. They're not individual. Um, so go in a group, be with people. So I think I've gotten all the ones in the chat. Um, does anybody else, anybody else have a question? Feel free to pop in. I have a question about its applicability for chronic pain. Um, 
Uh, there's lots of data about ketamine and pain. So if you have chronic pain and you're looking for you know, a medical option, I would look into ketamine, a ketamine clinic. We have really good success with chronic pain patients. Dr. Agarwal is a pain specialist here, and he is, uh, he's been working with and studying I, um, uh, ketamine for a long, long time. So yeah, ketamine would be a place to start. Anybody else? Doctor, I know you uh, you mentioned there's going to be a panoply of things, but what would you say are the best psychedelics for anxiety versus depression? I don't know. Um, I I don't know. Have you tried any? Uh, yeah, I've tried. Uh, I've tried a few. They're they've all been interesting for at the time. Yeah. <laughs> You know, Bob, I don't think we know yet. Um, and anxiety and depression often go together, you know, fear and, and sadness. Uh, and, and I'm not sure they're totally separate processes. And most psychedelic medicines that have been uh, clinically studied, there's both anti-anxiety and antidepressant effect. But I don't know which is best. Probably in 20 years, we will. Thank you. And there is a question here about, can you combine M MDMA with ayahuasca? Um, really good question. Um, I'm sure there are Western ayahuasca practitioners now um, who will be adding, it's, it's like this, this synthesis of these cultures coming together. MDMA is often used in psilocybin ceremonies. You know, these are illegal in the United States, okay? But these are underground and they're often used, the MDMA is used to open the heart and then a psychedelic will be added later. Um, and MDMA, I don't really consider MDMA a psychedelic drug um, and it doesn't work by that serotonin mechanism. It's totally different. Um, but you'll, you'll be seeing, uh, I don't know an Iowa Squero that's using MDMA, but I'm sure I'm gonna meet some white person that's doing it soon. Do I just talk? Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Hi. Um, I have a family member who has Alzheimer's and she's in her late seventies. Yeah. And they, uh, it's my stepmom and she and my dad are very open to trying anything. In fact, they've completely set aside Western medicine and they're now working on diet and exercise yeah. and they've had some good results, but they want to go a little bit further. Uh, how would, like, they can't go down to South America. Is there a way for them to experience ayahuasca or how? No. No, no, they can't. I mean, not in the United States legally. And, and even, um, you know, there are uh, under the, under, under or illegal ayahuasca ceremonies happening all over the United States. But what I would suggest for your stepmother is maybe ketamine. Ketamine has been shown to produce neuronal, neuronal growth. And so um, in our patients with um, cognitive decline, we're using lion's mane mushroom and ketamine. So, and, and there's a little bit of data and it might be worth coming in, you know, schlepping into Seattle or bringing her in for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, we do have a question about the length of ayahuasca trip. Oh, yes, good point. Um, four to eight hours. And that's one of the values of it. It's a deep, long, immersive experience. It's not, uh, it's not like a, some people now are smoking dimethyltryptamine and it's like minutes and very intense. And I see this great question about ketamine for multiple sclerosis from Pat Scott, my, my uh, colleague. Um, I don't know. But I bet there's a paper. I mean, I you know, Google Google it, and I bet there's something on MS and ketamine. 
And if there is, let's talk, Pat. Thanks, Leanna. It's good to see you. I'll give, I'll let you know what I find. <laughs> okay, it's good to see you. Uh, oh, here's one from Jane. In my ayahuasca ceremonies, I never vomited, but had copious tears. Yes, I was told crying. Yes, I do agree. I do agree. And this vomiting thing, there's controversy about it. It's the one thing most Westerners, we are terrified of vomiting. I mean, I, when I, the most, it's so frightening the first time. I was so frightened to swallow this foul tasting tea. And because I was afraid I would vomit. And indeed I did vomit. And I, I vomited, you know, my experience was that I vomited up these horrible snakes into the vomit pot. And then I had um, the image or the Im impression of this cobra arching over me while I was vomiting. That's the kind of imagery that happens during these experiences. And that, that image is stuck with me forever. So tears, very important, yes. Oh yes, and here's one, uh, drinking ayahuasca versus smoking DMT. It's easier to retain the memories because it's immersive. A lot of people um, with these rapid like DMT smoke, they don't remember what happened. They just know something tremendous happened but they don't re retain the details. Ayahuasca is slow and it's one of the benefits. How important is it to do? Um, I, I think it's really important to do ayahuasca in a group. It was developed as a group therapy. The group effects are highly significant. Um, and there may be, um, you know, young shamanic practitioners in the United States that claim that they're shamanic practitioners and they get ayahuasca, I don't know from where, and, um, and they, they wanna give it to you as a therapist, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. I, I mean, me personally, because who made the ayahuasca? Where did it come from? And, um, and then I really do firmly believe in the group. And here's one. Oh, Solterra in Costa Rica, excellent retreat center. Yeah, Costa Rica has several really good ayahuasca retreat centers. Um, there is a wonderful movie called From Shock to Awe about uh, veterans with PTSD. Um, getting ayahuasca therapy, and I highly recommend that you watch it. Ooh, it's 8.01. Should we, any other questions? There is one up here. Are there, are there the same reports of others like smoking DMT? Uh, what do you mean? Say that again. Oh, are there the same reports of others what does that mean, Jeremy Young? Are there same reports of, you mean the experience of others? What do you mean? Did Jeremy leave? Jeremy, do you wanna come off mute and ask that question? Yeah, with, uh, you know, I've read the <clears throat> McKenna books and there's a lot of reports, consistent reports of like these others that people that, that are encountered sometimes, you know, there's yeah, some do. differences reported, like, right, I mean, like, what are their, um, but is, is that, is that a common, is that a similar experience to smoking DMT in that uh, regard? I, I re you're asking like one of the most profound questions is my big question has been yes many people in the psychedelic state experience encounters with other conscious beings now is that the imagination or is that people going into another dimension that's real we don't know and i think it's an open question and um i don't know but that that experience is fascinating All right, well, thank you, Dr. Standish. Um, that was fascinating as I knew it would be. Um, we had a great turnout. Thank you all for 
Yeah, yeah and everybody, everybody on the call, I really want you to support the Vashon Center for Art, Art Center, because, sorry, I'm doing a plug, because it's so vital to our community on Vashon, and um, the events that they put on are so good, and COVID has been really hard on them, so, you know, if you could see your way to donating to the center, it would be a great mitzvah for all of us. Okay. All right, everybody. Thank you for that as well, Dr. Standish. Said perfectly. Um, all right, everybody. Have a great night. Hope to see you all around here soon. Good night, everybody. Beautiful evening. Bye. Bye. Thank you. That's fine.